This is for Computer Science AS level 9618 for Cambridge. We're going to be talking about the hardware operations of hardware devices picking up where we left off of. So we had a whole bunch of learning targets and we split them up. In class, we talked about the difference between RAM and ROM, ROM and we talked about how they're used in a range of devices and systems. We also talked about the difference between static RAM and dynamic RAM, looked at when you would use one over the other. We also talked about how a combination of them are used today. We talked about the different types of ROM, and today we're focusing on uh, buffers and all these different hardware devices. So let's go ahead and uh, get started. So a laser printer uses dry powder ink and static electricity to print the whole page in one go. That is a brief overview. There's lots of steps which we're gonna talk about in just a minute. Now, there are also color laser printers and they use four color cartridges, blue, magenta, cyan, black. Uh, they mix those colors together and you get a whole range of colors that you can do. But there's a series of steps that are used for a laser printer and we need to go over them right now because you got to know how a laser printer works. So here are the steps. Data from the document is sent to the printer driver and the driver has a range of jobs that it needs to do. It needs to make sure the data that you are sending to the printer is in a format that the printer can understand. It checks to make sure that the printer you chose to print on is available, meaning it's not busy, it's not currently printing something, it's not offline that you're able to access it, it's not out of ink, it's not out of paper. So the printer driver is doing all of that. Now the data is sent to the printer and is stored in a temporary memory location that we call a printer buffer. The printer buffer holds the data to be printed. When the printer is ready, it feeds from the printer buffer to the printer and the printer will print it out. Now the printing drum is inside the a laser printer, obviously, and it's given a positive charge. Now as the drum rotates, a laser beam is scanned across it, removing the positive charge in certain areas. Well, this leaves a negative, negative charged areas which match the text or images of the page that you are printing out. The negatively charged sheet of paper is rolled over the drum, and this is how it knows where on the paper to be printed. Now the toner, which is the dry powder ink, on the drum sticks to the paper, producing an exact copy of the page sent to the printer. Now, it prevents the paper sticking to the drum by removing the electric charge on the paper. Otherwise, it's gonna be attracted and stick there. We don't want that to happen. After one rotation of the drum, this is done. The paper goes through a fuser, which is heated rollers, where the heat melts the ink so that it fixes permanently to the paper. And this is why if you've ever taken a sheet of paper from a laser printer, it feels nice and warm. It's because it's gone through a fuser, heated rollers. A discharge lamp removes all the electric charge from the drum, so it's ready to print the next page and go through all those steps again. Then we have 3D printers. These things are great. Uh, they produce solid working objects. They're built up layer by layer using powdered resin, powdered metal, paper, or ceramic. They have all kinds of different 3D printers and they're built layer by layer. Now we call this additive manufacturing. Building a statue, a 3D printer would print layer by layer, adding each layer until the final object was formed. Now there's also something known as subtractive manufacturing and it's a little different. It would carve the statue out of the solid object until the final item was produced. So we have additive, we add layer by layer, subtractive where we have the whole thing and we chisel away or get rid of what we don't need. Now direct 3D printing uses inkjet technology. The print head moves left to right like a normal printer does, but it also can move up and down to build the layers of of the object and I need to uh, hit the wrong button here so let's get back to where we were so you know hitting that uh, in button instead of the right arrow you know definitely a mistake there let's get back into it so binder 3d printing uses two passes for each layer the first pass sprays dry powder to build the object and then on the second pass and this is for each layer a binder which is a type of glue is used to form the solid layer. So it's actually binding it together with glue. So on the first pass, it adds the uh, dry powder to build the object. The second pass on that same layer is gonna put down a binder for the next, and we're gonna glue each layer together. 
Okay, so let's talk about a microphone. So a microphone has sound waves that come in. You have a diaphragm uh, which picks up the sound waves that you are producing. It goes through a cone. You have a coil inside wrapped around a permanent magnet. And then what it does is it converts it into a digital uh, sound, but there's something you need for that, and we're going to talk about that right now. So, a microphone can be plugged in through USB, it can be built in the computer, or it can even be wireless. A microphone converts sound waves into an electric current. The current produced can be stored as sound, which can be ampl amplified and sent to a speaker or to a computer for storage. The sound is created causing the air to vibrate. You hear my voice. It's just a bunch of air molecules that are vibrating together, carrying the sounds that I am making. Now a diaphragm in the mic, this is the top of the mic, picks up the air vibrations, causing the diaphragm inside to vibrate. The diaphragm is connected to a copper coil wrapped around a magnet using a cone. Now the cone moves in and out as the diaphragm vibrates, causing the coil to move back and forth. Well, the movement of the coil causes the magnetic field around the magnet to be disturbed, causing an electric current. And the electric current is the key. It's either going to be amplified or sent to a recording device. The electric current is not digital, but it is analog in nature. Because it's analog and we want to make it digital, if we're storing it, an analog to digital converter will convert the sound waves into digital values, zeros and ones, which can be stored on the computer. All right, so here we have a microphone and here we have an analog to digital converter. So the picture we looked at earlier, you have an analog signal sent uh, into the uh, microphone. It's going to be fed into the analog to digital converter, which would be a sound card in this example. And then it's going to turn it into a bunch of zeros and one, and then it's going to be stored on the computer. So you need an analog to digital converter to store sound on a computer with a microphone. Now, we have speakers which do the exact opposite. Instead of taking sound in, they push sound out. Notice it's very similar. We have a cone, we have a magnet with a coil of wire wrapped around it, and it works just like a microphone, but in reverse. Instead of taking sound waves in, it pushes sound waves out. So with the speaker, if we have a digital file, which is a sound on a computer, it can be converted, in, it can be converted into sound by a few simple steps. This time, instead of an analog to digital converter, we need a digital to analog converter. It converts the digital file, the zeros and ones, into an electric current. It is then passed through an amplifier because the current generated by the digital to analog converter is so small. The current needs to be amplified large enough to drive the speaker so we can hear the sound. The current is fed into the speaker where it is converted in the sound. The current flows around a coil of wire wrapped around an iron core, which becomes temporarily electromagnetic. And we have a permanent magnet next to this iron core. The iron core will be attracted to the magnet differently depending upon the electric current being produced by those zeros and ones. And this causes vibrations. And since the core is attached to the cone, the cone vibrates producing sound. Now this cone is paper thin and is usually made from synthetic materials or even plastic. All right, the magnetic hard disk. If you have a hard disk drive, this is what uh, you have, a magnetic hard disk. They're known as HDD, hard disk drives. Data stored as digital formats on the magnetic surfaces of disk and these surfaces we call platters. Now each hard drive has a number of platters that can spin around 7,000 times a second. The read or the write heads, which are on the same arm, can access all surfaces of the disk drive and they're going to spin around about 7,000 times a second. When you start a computer up and you have a hard disk drive, you may hear it start to whir. That's because it's spinning around 7,000 times a second. Now the heads can move quick. They move to the center of the disc, disc and back to the edge 50 times a second. Now the surface of the disc has what is known as sectors and tracks. Each sector 
has a set number of bytes. And we're going to be talking about sectors later this year when we do our defragmentation and disk utility software um, exercise in class. Now, hard disk drives or the magnetic hard disk, they have an issue with latency. And that means the amount of time a block of data needs to rotate around the read write head. This is why you see please wait, or if it's really bad, not responding from a program. When saving to a hard disk drive, a file can become what's called fragmented. This is when a file is created and changes in size and updated. The file will be stored on sectors that aren't adjacent to each other. So say you're using sector A, B, and C. Then you download a music file that takes up D, E, F. You open up the Word document you were working on and you save it. Well, D, E, F is already full. So now the next part of that Word document is going to be stored in G, H, I. So now the disk has to load every single piece that's been fragmented, which takes it longer and longer and longer to load over a period of time. It is a direct access device. This means data in a given sector needs to be read sequentially. And this is why if you do not defrag your computer and you have a hard disk drive, it runs slow because everything is scattered and it must be read sequentially from beginning to end. And most removable hard disk are hard disk drives. You can go to the store and you can buy one really cheap for a good size one for you know anywhere from 60 to 100 bucks. Uh, you can get them, they're removable. And then we have solid state drives which are newer, more expensive, but a lot faster. So this reduces latent issues greatly. If you have a solid state drive and you turn on your computer, it will start up in literally seconds. There are no moving parts and all data is retrieved at the same rate, which exponentially increases the speed. Most solid state drives store data by controlling the movement of electrons within NAND chips. The data is stored as zeros and ones, just like all the other ones are. The zeros and ones are stored in millions of tiny transistors within the chip itself. And this effectively produces non-volatile -vol memory, unlike RAM, which is volatile. We also call this flash memory. Your flash drive, your USB drive, uses a solid state drive, which is why it's called a flash drive, because it is flash memory. And then we have an optical disc reader or writer. These are your CD burners and your DVD burners, which also play CDs and DVDs. Your Blu-rays, these are optical discs and you need a reader to view them or writer to burn data to these. Now these are all done by a type of laser and each one works a little differently, which allows them to be used. Now, when burning data, a light sensitive organic dye actually stores the data. Just like a hard disk drive platter, it has a single spiral track running from the center all the way out to the edge. The optical head moves to where the laser is when the disk spins from the center outwards. The outer part moves faster than the inner part of the disk. Now, data is stored into what is known as pits and bumps, which we also call lands on the spiral track. The disk may feel smooth, but it's actually not. There are actually pits and bumps. DVDs can store more than CDs because the pit size and track width are actually smaller. This means more pits and bumps can be stored. Now, DVDs and CDs both use a red laser. Blu-rays can store even more than DVDs, and that's because they're not using a red laser. They're using a blue light or a blue laser, which is used, which can pack the pits and bumps even tighter together. So what do pits and bumps look like if you can't tell they're there and the disc feels smooth? Well, the pits that are burned into the disc are red as one, the bumps as zeros. What does that look like? Looks just like this. So here's a CD. We have some pits, which are these lands, and we have the bumps, which you can see protruding. Now, this is really zoomed in. That's a CD, and you're like, wow, those are, those are pretty packed together. Well, you can see they are actually pretty packed together, but then you get a DVD, which packs them even tighter, and you can see it's more than half the distance between each pit and bump. So these are you know, 1.6 micrometers across. Here we have 0.74. And then a DVD, you pack them even tighter. 
So the, uh, the DVD is 7, 0.74 microns. The Blu-ray, 0.32 microns. So they're really packed in there. If you were able to zoom in on a disc, this is what you would be able to see. All right, touchscreens, capacitive. So they are both input and output devices. They use LED or OLED technology. And there's two types of touchscreens, LCD capacitive and LCD resistive touchscreens. Now, capacitive is made of many layers of glass that act like a capacitor. It creates electric fields between the layers of glass plates. You know, I just hit end again. I just cannot get away from doing that. All right, capacitive is made of many layers. We said that when the top glass layer is touched, the electric current changes. The coordinates of where it is touched is handled by a microprocessor. Now, some benefits include medium cost, not cheap, but not high. The screen's visible even in strong sunlight. You're not going to get that glare where you can't see anything. Allows for multi-touch capability, and the screen's very durable. It takes a major impact to break the glass. The drawback is you must use your bare finger as a form of input. The latest screens, though, also allow for use of a special stylus that can be used. But if you have gloves on and you're trying to use your phone and your touchscreen is capacitive, you're not going to be able to. So there's some benefits, but there's some drawbacks as well. The next screen is what we call resistive. It makes use of an upper layer of polyester, which is really just a form of plastic, and a bottom layer of glass. When the top layer is touched, the top and bottom layer connect to form a circuit. Signals are sent out, interpreted by a microprocessor. The calculations done determine where it was touched. Now, the benefits are it's inexpensive technology, and you can use your bare fingers, glove fingers, and stylus to do the input operations. The screen, though, is not easy to see in sunlight, does not allow for multi-touch capabilities. The screen durability, uh, you know, yeah, it, there's a trade-off here. It's fair, it can scratch easily, and the screen will wear out over time. So there's benefits and drawbacks to each. So here's a capacitive. You can see it is uh, sending out a current of where it was touched. Resistive, you're actually pushing down and you're making a uh, connection which changes uh, the current. So study the benefits and drawbacks of each. All right, virtual headset, this is it. We're gonna be done here. So virtual reality. It has been around for many years. It is not new. It's been around for a very, very long time. It's just getting better and better and better. And it has many applications besides video games. Engineers can walk around inside dangerous areas like a nuclear power plant without actually being there. A virtual reality headset gives the engineer the feeling of being there. And here's how it works. Video sent from a computer to a headset. Now this is done with HDMI or smartphone fitted into the headset. Now two feeds are sent to the display. Sometimes one screen displays the left side and the other the right side. Lenses placed between the eyes and the screen allows for focus and reshaping of the image for each eye giving a 3D effect and adding to the realism a feeling like you're actually there. There is a 110 degree field of view, which is enough to give someone a pseudo 360 degree view. You can look to the left, you can look to the right, and it adjusts, making you feel like you can look all the way around you. It simulates a true realistic image by using a frame rate of 60 to 120 images per second. Now, a series of sensors measure the movement which changes the image or video on the screen reacting with the user's head movement. Now, these sensors are usually gyroscopic or accelerometers. Now, the headsets use surround sound, which is used in a speaker to output. So it comes from behind you, so you can hear things behind you from the side or off in the distance, creating a realistic 3D sound. Now, some of them are advanced and they use infrared sensors monitoring to monitor your eye movements. This allows accurate depth of field, meaning when you look into the distance, it causes objects in the foreground to become fuzzy, just like it does in real life. So this is gonna be it for ours. We're all gonna be done here. If you have a question, please post it below. 
We'll see you guys in class and in the next video.